right, thanks for coming out, everybody. Really excited to present some work I've been working on over the last few months that has to do with training interpretable machine learning models and coming up with ways to turn those machine learning models into Yara rules. It's really quick, just to introduce myself. My name is Andrew Davis. I'm a principal data scientist at Elastic. I've been there for about nine months now. And generally speaking, I've been teaching computers how to detect malware since about 2014. So I've trained a variety of malware classifiers, such as malware classifiers that target Windows PEs, OS X Macos, Linux ELFs, I've trained models that detect things, detect malware inside of PDFs, inside of RTFs, inside of docs, and things like that. So training machine learning models on malware is kind of my bread and butter. So really quick, intro and motivation. Um, First of all, YAR is a really great line first defense against malware. If you can extract a sequence of bytes from a piece of malware and if it can slam dunk 100% of the time detect that piece of malware, it's really quick to sort of roll out these YAR rules to be able to detect new particular kinds of variants. Deep learning on the other hand has been used as a very effective way of detecting malware, but unfortunately its decisions are usually incomprehensible in the way that the models are usually set up. So the typical deep learning model is set up in such a way that you have an input of a malware sample coming in, and then you have a score for the malware sample at the end, but it's really hard to trace back and figure out what the model was thinking to come up with a decision to call something malicious or benign. On the other hand, deep learning models are very, very, very flexible in the sense that you can set up a deep learning model to do something really simple, like you know, just a fully connected deep neural network, or you can do something really complicated, like a transformer model or an attention model and in this way, you can come up with ways to make the model interpretable from the get-go. In other words, structure your model in such a way that when you look at the model's decision-making, you can come up with ways to figure out why the model made that decision. So what we're going to do in this talk is I'm going to show you a way to set up a deep learning model that's interpretable from the get-go, and you can take that interpretability and turn that into your rules. So there's a lot of related work on this subject. Um, there's one particular paper by Ed Raff and a bunch of other authors called Automatic ER Rule Generation Using Bi-Clustering. And in this talk, they work on this previous idea of kilo engrams, where they take these long byte sequences, and they take this idea and come up with a way to cluster them together, and come up with complex ands and ors and other things of strings, and be able to make workable ER rules based on small corpuses. So you can feed in a single sample or a number of samples, and it'll generate you a rule that has a high true positive rate and a low false positive rate for the samples you're sending in. There is another similar one called Yaya Gen. What it does is it looks at um, cuckoo logs for Android APKs. So you send in an Android APK to this particular Android sandbox, you detonate the sample, and then this thing is able to look at the detonation report and come up with YAR rules to detect new variants of malware based on the your rules that it outputs from the um, from the sandbox detonation. And finally, there's a really cool project by Joshua Sachs called Yara ML. And the way it works is you take a logistic regression or random forest model, and then you use some clever sort of hacks to figure out how to turn that logistic regression model into a Yara rule, or change that random forest model into a Yara rule. So how do we make an interpretable model? So as I was saying before, deep learning models look at sort of the whole of the sample to get a score. So you feed in some bytes, you feed in an image, whatever you're doing with the deep learning model. And then at the output, you get a final score, like this is malicious, or this is a bird, this is a plane, whatever the model is trying to classify. So in that typical way of setting things up, you don't have a lot of interpretability. There, there are sort of bolt-on methods that you can use to try and go back and get interpretability. Like one really good one is called Lime, where you perturb the input pixels and see if perturbations change the output much. And then you say the things that modified the input much were important. So you say that these regions were important for the classification. But generally speaking, in my experience, getting interpretability for deep learning models for malware recognition it's sort of a crapshoot as to whether or not you're going to get something useful from the interpretability from something like Lime. So in this work, what we do is we set up the model in such a way that when we feed in any contiguous series of bytes, we can get an output score. So we can feed in a sequence like you have been pwned and we should get something really high, like 
Or if we feed in something like, please send five Bitcoins to this Bitcoin wallet, then we get a high score. Whereas if we feed in a different benign string, or if we feed in a benign string, like this program cannot be run in DOS mode, we should get a really low score from the model. So we structure it in such a way that we feed in the entire bytes of the sample, and then for each byte we feed in, that represents some range of bytes, we should be able to get a score back out. And in this way, the model is interpretable in the sense that we can look at the output score, and if the output score is high, then we have a direct way to look back through the model to see which byte sequences the model found benign or malicious. And then what we can do is we can look at the particular offsets for byte sequences the model thought was bad, and then rip those out and create ER rules based on these. So before I go much further into the model architecture, I'd like to do a quick primer on convolutional neural networks to get a better idea of how this model works. It's not going to be very in-depth. It's going to be very simple. Um, Everything that's less important has been kind of abstracted away. But basically what convolution is doing is it's going to take some function. In this case, the function is represented by these three squiggly lines here. And it's going to take three bytes on the input, and then it's going to apply a function to those bytes. It doesn't really matter what the function is so much. In the case of deep neural networks, it's just multiplications and additions, but that's not super important to know. And it's going to take those three bytes, and it's going to do something to them, and then it's going to output a score or some representation. And basically, what we can say is the output of that function is going to be directly representative of those three bytes that we see. So we can take this function, and we just kind of take it, and we slide it down all the bytes that we have on a sample. So this time, we're outputting a score or a representation of bytes one through three. And this time, we're outputting a representation of bytes two through four. So basically, you take a function, you apply the function each time identically to each set of bytes that you see. And then on the output, you have outputs that correspond to certain ranges of the input. So further, we can sort of stack these convolutions together in a way that instead of having an output score, we have an output representation. And then we just do a whole bunch of stacks of convolutions until we get to some output. <clears throat> and in this case, each time we do another stack, we basically get a larger receptive field. In other words, the output byte representation that we see is going to go back further and represent a wider series of bytes. So if we want longer ER rules, then we can add more steps in the convolution or add more layers of convolution. So we can see that on the output, we're representing bytes 0 through 6, and we do a step with the convolution. And then the second output there is going to represent bytes 1 through 7. So we can see that the interpretability here is basically the ability to look at an output of the model and be able to tie it directly back to a sequence of bytes that affected that score. So how the model works, the slide is meant a little bit for the machine learning people who want to understand a little bit better what exactly the architecture of the model looks like. So we're going to take a whole bunch of bytes from a binary. Um, in the context of the talk, I'll show some results later on ELF and Mako and PE. But generally speaking, we can feed whatever bytes we want into this model. So we'll feed in some bytes, and then each byte is going to be sent through an embedding layer. For the folks who aren't super familiar with that, what an embedding layer might be, it's more or less a way to take something from a byte into a whole bunch of floating point numbers that the neural network can then understand and work with. So we're going to take each byte, put it through an embedding layer, and then we put it through a whole bunch of convolution layers. And each convolution in this case is going to be followed up with a rectified linear layer. I think in the most recent set of experiments, I was actually using a PRLU layer for the ML folks. And we do a whole bunch of these layers. And then at the end, we have a sigmoid layer what the sigmoid layer does is it sort of crushes the values the model is able to output between 0 and 1. So this makes it so that if the score is 0, then we interpret it as benign. And if the score is close to 1, we interpret it as malicious. So one thing to point out is that there are no max pooling layers in this architecture. And this is because if we were to include things like max pooling layers, we would start to drastically increase the size of our receptive field of the input bytes. So a max pooling layer is basically going to downsample stuff by a factor of two or three or four or whatever you choose. So if we started putting max pooling layers in here, instead of creating signatures based on 16 or 32 contiguous bytes, we would be creating signatures on things that are 256 bytes, 512 bytes long. And that wouldn't be as useful as a signature. It would be a much less general signature. So basically, the more convolutional layers we apply, the deeper this thing goes, the larger the receptive field that we get. 
And practically speaking, I think I used five or six layers to give us something like 24 or 30 byte long Yara signatures. So basically this architecture is going to work like you feed in a thousand bytes and you're going to feed in about, a, or you're going to receive about a thousand scores back. So in terms of training the model, there are some practical things to talk about here. So for model training, I sort of refer to this as finding needles in a haystack. We're going to have these malicious strings, which are strings or byte sequences that occur only in malicious samples. And then we have benign strings, which are strings that are seen either in malicious or benign samples. So we want to train the model in such a way that if we see a zero, that really says nothing informative about the string or the byte sequence. It just means that there's nothing specifically malicious about it. Whereas if we get an output of one, we want that to mean this is a rare and informative string that says that this thing is indeed malicious. So this means that the model is going to have to output very sparse outputs. It's going to have to be zeros for most of the output bytes that it sees, except for the occasional very malicious thing, like a particular opcode sequence associated with, I don't know, a particular kind of cryptor or something like that. And yeah, we basically want the model to output zeros for almost everything except for strings associated with maliciousness. So the way we do this is we use a thing called top case selection. So really quick, when you're talking about backpropagating or training neural networks, you're going to look at an output and then you're going to feed the error of the output back through the model to be able to get a way to update your model in such a way that it better classifies something. In this case, we're going to have sort of this needle in a haystack thing, so it doesn't really make sense to update every single output in the model. So we do this top case selection, which basically means look at all the scores we see on the output and sort them based on their magnitude. So you know we'll sort it descending from one to zero. And then we're going to select the top k-valued scores to backpropagate through or to update with respect to. And what this does is it heavily promotes malicious stuff while very quickly squashing down benign stuff. And practically speaking, for top K, I would select, let's say, the top 10 strongest outputs from the model. And this also has the side benefit of sparsifying the outputs, so we get exactly what we want. We get a model that's looking for needles in a haystack that's quickly able to pick out malicious strings and ignore uninformative ones. And again, this has the side effect of very quickly pushing benign or un uninformative strings down to zero because we are selecting the most malicious things that the model sees for that point of model training and we're actively squashing those things down and we're ignoring everything else. Another practical consideration to talk about is how do we fit this onto a GPU? So the executables that I was training on could range in size anywhere from a few kilobytes up to tens of megabytes if they were an installer or something like that. And GPUs only have so much memory. And another thing to point out is that when we feed these bytes through the embedding layer, and when we feed these representations of bytes through all these deep convolutional activations, we're going to increase the amount of memory that we need by a factor of thousands. So this one megabyte sample is all of a sudden going to need something like eight gigabytes of GPU memory to be able to process. So to deal with this, what I did was I took each sample and I broke it up into 64 kilobyte chunks chunks. So I take a sample, break it into a whole bunch of 64 kilobyte chunks, and then I feed all those chunks through the model step by step so I don't have to use a whole lot of memory. And then I keep track of the score that's associated with the most, or rather, I keep track of the bytes of the score that was most positive. So I might feed in, let's say, 128 chunks, and then I'll keep track of the chunk that had the highest score and only update the model with respect to that chunk. And this is really nice because we're doing this top case selection thing because the model is only going to care about the top valued things anyways. So we can get away with this clever speed hack by just updating with respect to the most malicious looking chunk that we saw. And this has a huge decrease on the required GPU memory to train a workable model. So another issue that I ran into was reducing false positives. So what I found was that the neural network that I was training was trying very, very hard to find these shortcuts to kind of solve the problem in unexpected ways. And it would do this by doing things like, oh, I don't know, on the ELF corpus, I found a whole bunch of samples that 
the model was consistently calling bad based on some specific GCC compiler strings and libc versions that just happened to be near the end of the sample. So this was a case where 99% of the time where the model would see these strings would be correct because they were just uploaded in mass to VT. And they were fairly infrequent in the benign set. So 99% of the time you see it's malicious, 1% of the time you see it's benign. And the model thinks that's a fair trade-off. So it says, whenever I see a GCC of this version and a libc of this version, then I'll call it bad. That's clearly not a very good string. So what I did to counteract this is I kept track of a rolling buck for false positives. So I would feed in a bunch of samples. And if there were any benign samples that came back as malicious, then I would throw this thing into a rolling buffer of false positives and keep them around for like 10 or 15 minutes. And then for each training mini batch where we select a small number of samples to update the model, I would sample from the data set and I would also sample from this false positive buffer and then feed that back into the model to basically overtrain the model on these things it was falsing on and try and bring this 99% versus 1% thing up closer to 50-50. And another thing to point out is that in this rolling buffer of false positive setup that I have, I sample things that have a higher score more frequently than things that have a lower score. So the things that are more wrong get seen more frequently and that helps to fix those problems more quickly. So signature generation, we have an interpretable model. How do we extract ERI signatures from these models? So there are two ways we can do it. We can do it per sample, or we can do it in bulk. Per sample, I imagine would be useful to reverse engineers and analysts and people like this, so that you can take a small number of samples, let's say 10 or 15 samples that belong to the same family, let's say, and be able to generate a YAR ruler two or three around these samples. Then there's a second regime in bulk where we want to take, let's say 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 samples and generate a few hundred rules that mostly capture the corpus of malware that you're feeding in. So sample by sample. I have a live demo here. Um, I'm calling this Python script that I wrote called dump sigs. And what dump sigs is going to do is it's going to load in a model that I've trained and run that model against a whole bunch of samples that I've specified. So what it's going to do is it's going to load up that model, and then it's going to attempt to extract signatures for 25 samples. These 25 samples I downloaded from virus total yesterday, it's just 25 samples where the number of positives was greater than 10, and the file type is elf. <clears throat> so what it's going to do is it's going to go through each one of these samples, run it through the model, and then extract out potential signatures or good signatures. And in this case, we can see we're going through this particular SHA-256, and we see this signature here, but we can see the score isn't very high. Um, this here is the score, and this here is the offset of the string. We can see it's not very high. It was the highest valued string that it could find, and we're just dumping that out because it might be a useful string. Um, for the others, it's going to dump out scores and strings associated with sort of what I would like to call slam dunk, dunk signatures, where the signatures have really high scores. Um, it's going to output those potential scores for each model, and then it'll just choose the max that it sees for each one. Um, we can see a number of strings here that probably wouldn't make as good signatures. This is sort of indicative of that 99%, 1% problem that I referred to earlier. This string here is going to be, it looks like a few glibc things like stir and copy and stir case comp and a few things like that. So this particular sequence of, I'm gonna guess imports on ELFs, the model seems to think is malicious. It might be right, it might be wrong. Um, it's up to the analyst to determine if that's a good string to put into the ER rule. Then it's going to run this over, again, the 25 samples that I've presented it with. And then at the very end, it's going to give us a YAR rule that tries to detect as many samples as it can in those 25 samples. So you can just take that and copy paste it into a YAR rule and put that into production after, of course, making sure that there are no false positive triggered. So the second regime is generating signatures in bulk. 
what we're doing here is we're feeding in, again, tens of thousands of samples through the model to come up with a good set of, I don't know, 100, 200, 500 signatures that roughly capture as many malicious samples as it can. What we're going to do is we're going to take a pre-trained model and we're going to run it over as many samples in our malicious and benign corpuses as we can get. And then for malicious samples, it'll grab the max score that it sees in the sample and the associated string associated with that score. And it's also going to do the same for benign strings. So if it sees a benign string with a relatively high score, it's going to take that string and add it to a list of banished strings. In other words, it's going to say, don't ever use these strings because we saw it as a false positive and we don't want this leaking into our set of production strings. So we're going to go through, we're going to remove out all the benign false positives and we're going to be left behind with a set of strings that captures as much malicious stuff as possible. And we're going to sort things by prevalence. So if we have a string or a byte sequence that matches, let's say 10% of our data set, that's really useful and we want to promote this string so that it definitely gets selected in our final list of strings that we put out. Then what we're also going to do is we're going to cluster strings together based on this thing called Hamming distance. Hamming distance is a pretty simple operation where you just look at two byte sequences of the same length and then you compare their bytes and if any of the bytes are different, then you increment the Hamming distance by one. So if you have two byte sequences that differ by two bytes, then you're gonna have a Hamming distance of two. We're going to go through all the signatures that we found. We're going to cluster them together based on Hamming distance. And then every single string in a particular cluster, we're going to look at their differences and then we're going to use that as a mask and then replace all the differences with a wild card. So an example of this, we can see off to the right. We can see a bunch of byte sequences. I think there are 16 or so that are all mostly the same except for the middle byte where the middle byte appears to be a random value. So to get more bang for a buck for the signature, what we can do is we can replace that middle byte with just a wildcard and be able to collapse those 16 signatures that the model dumped out into just a single signature. So in terms of signature efficacy, I trained three models. I trained an ELF model, I trained a Mako model, and I trained a PE model. ELF is the Linux executable format. Mako runs on OS X, and PE is the Windows executable file format. For ELF, I collected data from 2017 to 21. For Mako, I just collected everything. And for PE, I selected a small set from 2020 to 2021. For ELF, I had 84,000 bad samples that I was able to scrape from virus total. I had 5.5 million good, and that breaks down as 4.5 million Ubuntu samples. I basically just set up a job to rip through an Ubuntu package repository and extract out all the devs and grab all the ELFs from those devs and then put them up to S3 for storage. Then I grabbed 1 million samples from virus total. For Mako, we have about a 10%, 90% uh, breakdown of bad and good. And for PE, we have about a 50-50 breakdown between bad and good. In terms of true positive rates and false positive rates, for ELF, we got about an 81% true positive rate with 950 rules. Um, that's at a 0% false positive rate for Ubuntu samples. Um, when I ran the bulk collection job, or the bulk signature generation job, I made sure that the Ubuntu sequences were weighted more highly than the virus total samples because virus total samples can still be kind of falsy even if there is zero vendor detections. And we got about a 0.15% false positive rate on virus total samples. For Mako, we got a 90% true positive rate at a 0.01 false positive rate with just 11 rules. This was a very surprising result. And I think this is mostly because there are a lot of mostly mostly identical samples in the Mako data set that I collected. There's this one particular kind of malware family called Eagle Quest that just dominates the set of malicious samples. I think it's like 30%. And in the end, the model just learned to cue in on those very simple things to come up with an accurate, but not all encompassing classifier. And then for PE, we got about an 80% true positive rate at a 0.07 false positive rate with 700 rules. So in terms of future work, I'd really like to utilize more YAR functionality. YAR is a very expressive language and I'm only using a very, very small subset of it. There are things like string offset that we could put into the model. We could make the model aware of where a string is in the sample to provide more context. So if you see something like this program can't be run in DOS mode in the middle of the sample, that might be kind of weird and the model would know about things like that. We could also add string counts. So the model might be able to look at how often a string occurs in a sample, 
There's also a very expressive Boolean operation logic thing that we can use in Yara. So we can have different sets of strings and we can end and or these things together and then have string count thresholds and things like this. And extending the model's ability to account for things like this would be really useful in terms of increasing true positive rates and decreasing false positive rates. I'd also like to introduce model-driven string wild carding into the setup. So to replace this Hamming distance thing with uh, model-driven string wild carding where we use the model's input sensitivity and we feed in a byte sequence, we get its score, and then we look at a byte and we start moving that byte around, we replace it with random values. And if the model score doesn't change much, we can say, well, the model doesn't care much about this byte, so we can just wildcard it. And yeah, the, this would be much less hacky in a much more model-driven way of doing wildcarding. I'd also like to integrate this tool with parsing libraries, so have better context in terms of what exactly the byte sequence is. If the byte sequence is in, let's say, an executable section or something like that, maybe we can do some disassembly and then get an idea of what kind of opcodes are around this, around the signature that we grabbed out, see if the see if the bytes that we're grabbing out are in the overlay section, see if they correspond to data, see if they correspond to code, see if they correspond to interesting things in headers, things like this. I feel like that would be really useful for malware analysts to be able to quickly be able to look at a string or a sequence of bytes and be able to see where those bytes came from and see if that would be a workable rule. So with that, I'd like to thank you a lot for showing up to this talk. Again, very excited about this work. And yeah, I'll open up the floor for questions. Thanks again.